Previously on Deep Cover. In the mid-1980s, the FBI took down a massive drug smuggling ring, which was importing huge loads of marijuana from Colombia into the United States. With the help of agent Ned Timmons, the three ringleaders were caught and imprisoned. Case closed, or so it appeared, until one of the ringleaders, Stephen Kalish, revealed that there was a silent partner, and he was none other than General Manuel Noriega, the ruler of Panama and a top CIA asset. This prompted congressional hearings and an indictment. Meanwhile, Ned was still busy at the FBI. Thanks to all of his undercover work, Ned still had all kinds of contacts in the drug world. And they were still paying off. In fact, he was getting even deeper into the illegal drug trade. These are the people that would have supplied the drugs to like Lee Rich. They're the people that controlled everything on the north coast of Colombia. At one point, Ned posed as a buyer and he busted a smuggler who was bringing in cocaine and marijuana into the US. So another win for Ned. And it also opened yet another door for him. Afterwards, Ned got a call from the smuggler's wife, a woman from Colombia. We'll call her Simone. Simone reached out to Ned because she wanted to help her husband. Basically, she wanted to get his sentence reduced or get him moved to a better prison. Simone had information to trade. So she contacted Ned, hoping to make a deal. She was connected with the biggest people in the cartels and talked a good game. She knew what she was talking about. She knew the right names. Ned was eager to work Simone's connections, but he was also leery about messing with the Colombians. They don't think twice of killing you, the Colombians. Anything can happen, you know. You remember, you don't know anybody but yourself. So Ned had his concerns, but he's still interested in working with Simone, seeing where her connections might take him. He decided to ask his wife, Kathy Timmons, for help. At the time, Kathy was busy with her own work at the FBI, and she was pregnant with their second child. So Ned said, I want you to come down and, and meet her so that, you know, she has someone that she can call as the backup person to me, you know, blah, blah, blah. Blah, 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 as in, here we go again. I mean, she'd been through this before, like when Ned came home with Toby Anderson, the violent country western singer. And now this. I always was being introduced to his, his informants or his cooperators as, as like the backup person. You know, I wasn't listed as the co-case agent or anything like that. I think it just gave Ned a, a feeling of, you know, and, may, and maybe he did it to try and further show the, uh, the cooperator, you know, that here's, here's someone else that, you know, has, has got your back. So, despite it all, Kathy agreed to meet Simone, Ned's latest source, at a hotel in Detroit. I went down to the hotel and, and met her and, you know, she spoke briefly and said, well, you know, if you need anything, give me a call, you know, that you're going to be working with Ned. But on the way home, Kathy had second thoughts about the whole arrangement. I mean, she was a strikingly beautiful woman. And now she's sitting here with no husband. She's got no other connections besides Ned. You know, it's not a, not a good situation to have your husband involved in. I mean, you can almost predict trouble. I'm Jake Halpern, and this is Deep Cover. Our final episode, 1989. Yes? Hey, this is... This is Jake. How are you? I'm okay. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? That's Simone. 
There are a lot of details about her story that I can't share with you. I need to protect her identity. But here's what you need to know. After meeting Ned, she started brainstorming with him about what intel she could offer. She was still hoping to help her husband, who at this point was in federal prison in Michigan. Well, we started conversations, a lot of conversations. He was, as I said, a person that you could trust. But she was scared about ratting on the cartels. And ultimately, she got cold feet. It was too dangerous, so I didn't want to keep on going. And this meant she couldn't help her husband. But she actually kept meeting with Ned. And I think at the, one of those days, we were sitting in a restaurant. We felt attracted to each other. Simone says that she trusted Ned. More than that, that he seemed like a hero to her. That's the word she used. Well, because the way he moved, the way he talked, his security, his self-confidence, how mature he was, and those were things in his personality that I was attracted. Simone eventually told Ned that she was willing to connect him with other sources. She knew another Colombian who needed help and he was willing to talk. Simone even offered to meet Ned in Venezuela and make the necessary introductions. They spent a week down there together. Oh, Jake. It's almost like uh, the two of us were separated from the world. You know, just sat around, drank wine, and, and uh, talked about other stuff. And, well, she was intelligent, she was beautiful. You know, I mean... You walk through the airport with her and people were running into pilings and walls and dust staring at her, you know. I spoke with another FBI agent who was down in Venezuela with them. He told me that Simone was beguiling. He said, quote, she didn't walk, she glided. She was quite the beauty and she knew how to use it too. This agent suspected that Ned and Simone were getting a bit too close, but he didn't say anything in part because Ned was such a veteran at this type of work. Ned and Simone did have an affair. It actually started just a few months after they met. It was like an escape. An escape from what? An escape from drug cases and FBI and, and uh, you know, stress and, and whatever. It was a release. It was almost like I didn't care anymore. What do you mean you didn't care about what exactly? I was totally burned out with the FBI and the stress of, of running big cases like this and dealing with other divisions and other agencies. And, you know, it's very complicated to work big cases and, and abide by the rules and, and, and all the legal issues and FBI protocol and everything. It was just an escape. I asked Simone if she ever felt pressured or coerced by Ned. She said no, never, that their feelings were mutual and her family adored Ned. And he was really also a gentleman with me. He's, at the same time, he was like strong, he was sweet. You know, when you fall in love, you fall in love, you know? All of that being said, Ned's affair created some serious problems. Obviously, it was not good for his marriage. And professionally, well, Ned was a federal agent. Simone was providing information to the FBI, and Ned was supposed to be assessing the value of her intel. Could she or her connections help the US government or not? Now, Ned couldn't really make that call objectively. There was a conflict of interest and a power imbalance too. It's not too ethical. It wasn't too honorable, you know. Um, it just happened. After it started, did you have a moment of like, oh shit, what have I done kind of thing? Yeah, I mean, you always had thoughts that it's the wrong thing to do. It's, not, it's nothing you want to, want to become public or, or whatever. Um, you know, it, 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 it was just kind of spiraling out of control. It, it, uh, I didn't know where it was going to land.
While all of this was going on, Ned's biggest case, the one that helped spark congressional hearings and the indictment of Noriega, that case, was still simmering. The defendants in the case were all serving time. Mr. Beach Club, the gentleman smuggler, and the grocery guy. They're just counting the days and the weeks and the months. Until one day in mid-December of 1989, when something weird happens. On that day, Stephen Kalish, the gentleman smuggler, says he was thrown into solitary confinement. Well, solitary, you have no access to television, radio. I mean, you get a blanket, pillow, food. You don't have contact with other prisoners. It's basically for protection. Stephen had been watching the news for weeks and had an inkling that something big was about to go down in Panama. You know, they've ratcheted up this whole, this whole thing about Noriega and Panama. It's in the news almost daily. Noriega's waving a fucking machete around. I mean, I'm watching him just fall to pieces, you know. But I mean, the guy is off his rocker. For over a year, Noriega had been thumbing his nose at the U.S., basically saying, you guys want me gone, but you can't do anything about it. Remember, thanks in large part to this investigation and Stephen Kalish's account, Noriega had been indicted as a drug trafficker. And it seemed like this indictment was now fueling something bigger, like the U.S. might actually take action. In his novel, Ned writes about how big a deal it would be if the U.S. could take down Noriega. Ned knew that very little of what he was doing made any real difference in the drug war. It was a cynicism that came with the territory. As long as there was demand, there would be people willing to run the risks of supply. As long as 20 million Americans were smoking dope, there would be dope in America. There would be cocaine and heroin, and for the pill poppers, there would be crooked doctors and false prescriptions. He knew that. But getting to a guy like Noriega would make a difference. Down in Panama, Noriega was presenting himself as the great defender of his country and its canal. He delivered impassioned speeches, hyping his role as the hero. Almost like PR stunts, the way a promoter might hype an upcoming fight between two heavyweights. And this is when Noriega appeared, wielding a machete as he spoke to a crowd. And eventually, all of his taunts, they hit home with President George Bush Sr. Part of the problem was optics. To the public, Bush sometimes came across as mild-mannered and even meek. When he was running for president, Newsweek even ran a cover story about Bush that would become infamous, called Fighting the Wimp Factor. And now, here was Noriega, the uber alpha male, waving his machete. Gradually, tension mounted. The U.S. issued sanctions against Panama and tried pressuring Noriega to step down. Noriega just dug in his heels. So the stage was set, and then a group of Panamanian soldiers opened fire on four off-duty U.S. servicemen. Good evening. Ever since an American military man was killed by a Panamanian troop Saturday night, President Bush and Panama's military dictator, General Manuel Noriega, have been circling each other from a distance. Bush addressed the nation and laid out the case for war. Many attempts have been made to resolve this crisis through diplomacy and negotiations. All were rejected by the dictator of Panama, General Manuel Noriega, an indicted drug trafficker. They called the invasion Operation Just Cause. It was a big undertaking involving nearly 26,000 U.S. troops and 300 aircraft. During the fighting, 23 U.S. servicemen died. Hundreds of Panamanians were killed, maybe more. The exact death toll remains in dispute. Some estimates are in the thousands. It's a little stomach churning to think about the number of people who died to capture a single man. And for a while, Noriega himself was nowhere to be found, which back in D.C. was rather awkward. I've been frustrated that he's been in power this long. Extraordinarily frustrated. The good news, he's out of power. The bad news, he has not yet been brought to justice. 
U.S. forces eventually tracked down Noriega hiding in the Vatican Embassy. They tried to smoke Noriega out by blasting rock music at deafening volumes. I actually remember watching this all unfold as a kid on TV. The soldiers played songs like We're Not Gonna Take It by Twisted Sister. U.S. generals eventually called off the tactic after Vatican officials complained. Anyway, Noriega eventually turned himself in. And that was it. The last member of the smuggling syndicate was in custody. After his capture, Noriega was flown to Miami, where he went on trial. He was found guilty and sentenced to 40 years in prison on eight counts of drug trafficking, money laundering, and racketeering. Officially, that was the end of the story. Neatly packaged with a bow, Operation Just Cause, a righteous effort to take down a drug trafficker. But I gotta tell you, like so many people, I never really believed that this is why the U.S. invaded. So I talked with John Dingus, a former NPR journalist who covered Noriega at the time. He also wrote an excellent book on Noriega called Our Man in Panama. I don't buy the theories that are put forward of, uh, of why the invasion was done other than a raw exercise of U.S. power. For John, the war wasn't about drug trafficking charges or our desire to restore democracy in Panama. I think it was a power decision by George Bush the fact that Noriega had defied him personally. You don't fool around with the U.S. government in the way that Noriega was doing it. That's it. The old rules of the playground. A little guy acts out, the big guy puts him in his place. It's a classic gangster move. In the end, seems like what Ned Timmons and Stephen Kalish helped provide wasn't a motivation for war wasn't a cause. They just provided a convenient excuse. When we come back, a moment of reckoning for Ned, both for his marriage and his career. Months before the invasion, as the whole conflict between Bush and Noriega was still heating up, Ned was facing problems of his own. He'd been having an affair with his source, Simone, and he was still working with her, now down in Miami. At some point, he started to worry that his colleagues were spying on him. Like, he remembers this one day when he was driving around. I was starving, so I whipped around a few times and pulled into like a Burger King or something. And all of a sudden, here's... Uh, what I believe was an agent comes running, running through the alley and a prep radio fell out of his waistband. Then I look and I see him jump in a car and pretty obvious uh, FBI surveillance. Suddenly, the paranoia that Ned felt down in the Caymans kicked back in. There was a supervisor in Miami. I strongly believed that, you know, he, when I'd come into Miami for the meetings that He'd have me surveilled. I would meet with Simone, but never, you know, there was never overnight stuff or anything. Uh, I'd meet with her, usually had somebody else with me, whatever. You know, I think he kind of felt something was going on. Meanwhile, back in Detroit, Kathy gets a call from Ned's boss. He'd been in touch with the supervisor down in Miami, apparently the guy who'd been watching Ned. And the supervisor in Miami had said that Ned was in trouble and that they were pulling him in, and um, that, that Ned was having a, an inappropriate relationship, a sexual relationship with, um, with the female operative, and that, um, that Ned 100% denied it, but that they were going to be sending him home. Kathy says she'd actually suspected what Ned had been up to for some time. Kathy was an investigator, and a good one. 
She'd found hotel matches in Ned's coat one night and pieced together that he'd been visiting a hotel where Simone was staying. You know, you can imagine, it's a typical married fight at that point. It's got nothing really much to do with the FBI um, or his undercover work, and I couldn't have cared less about his undercover work at that point. I just said, you know, I don't want to. I don't want to talk to you about it. I don't, you know, I don't want you um, near me. Then there is the issue of what would happen to Ned professionally, what the consequences might be for having an affair with Simone. Typically, what you would do next in the FBI is you start an, an investigation to find out what may or may not have also been compromised on that case. I don't believe that they opened one up on him because he basically came home and said that he was going to resign. Ned says there was no investigation. He says he came back from Miami and resigned on his own accord. At the office in Detroit, no one knew why Ned suddenly disappeared. Even his partner, Linus Denilevicius, was mystified. I think everybody was kind of scratching their heads. It was kind of a shocker saying, um, gee, what happened? And the question was, you know, I mean, literally, uh, thinking back at it, nobody really knew, was he terminated or did he leave on his own? No, there was no real explanation as to why he was there one day and the next day he's not. Officially, the FBI said it wouldn't talk to me about Ned, but I did speak with one of Ned's former supervisors from the early 80s. He wasn't there when Ned resigned, but the way that it all played out for Ned, it didn't really surprise him. The supervisor told me that back then, in certain situations, agents did sometimes just resign to avoid a big, messy investigation. He also told me that six years was a very long time to do undercover work. At one point, I asked Ned, why didn't you just walk away before things got out of control, like back when your first son was born? I don't know if, if you want to call it an addiction, an adrenaline addiction, or you know, whatever it was, that's all I lived for was, to, I mean, you know, I love my kids. I, I, I talk to them every day yet, you know. Um, they're on separate sides of the U.S., but, I can, you know, I can't spend a lot of time with them. But, uh, you know, we, we talk every day. I don't know what would have happened. You know, maybe if I, I could have pulled the throttle back, you know, things would have been a lot different, but it didn't happen, so. Kathy says she respects what Ned accomplished as an agent, but it's all overshadowed by the cost that it exacted on both of them personally. And she still wonders how and if it might have all played out differently if somehow Ned had been able to walk away from the undercover work. If he had just been working cases, you know, you don't have those opportunities. You can't go sit at a bar all day if you're working cases. You know, you can't um, go off on these. You can't create a whole new persona of yourself. You are who you are. You're just an FBI agent. You're not God. You're not some movie star, you know, having dinners with fancy people in fancy places. And, you know, you're just an average person. If you remove the undercover work from the equation, might our marriage have failed over time because of alcohol and fooling around the stuff? Maybe, but we will never know. In any case, after he stepped down, Ned's colleagues at the FBI did throw him a little goodbye party. It was at this restaurant in Oakland County. Some people from the other law enforcement agencies from our old police department came. So it wasn't hugely attended, but you know, there were enough people there and um, you know, they gave him a plaque and wished him well and you know, we all had lunch and you know, he gave a little talk about how he'll miss the FBI and you know, but this is what he wants to do now and he worked so hard, and that's all he ever wanted to be, was an FBI agent. And he just threw it all away. Literally threw it all away. Looking back, Ned says that the undercover work, it kind of slowly wore him down, and that's why he resigned. I just had it. I just was out of gas. I wanted to do something different. Um, you know, I, I was just exhausted with the FBI. And I'm sure he was. 
But the way he talks about it, it's clear to me that these were his glory days. And honestly, I think part of Ned is still stuck in 1989. He talks about everything that happened like it was yesterday, boasting about the role that he played in history. And there is a certain logic to his conviction. Ned flipped Toby, which led him to shine, which perhaps more than anything else, led to the downfall of Lee Rich, and in a way, Stephen Kalish too. Without them, there's no star witness to testify against Noriega. And without that, well, there's much less of a pretext for invading Panama. A bit of a stretch? Maybe. But it's not crazy. When I was done reporting this story, I went back and reread Ned's novel. What struck me most was how and where it ended. The image that we're left with is of Ned at the very top of his game. Ned was back to the less glamorous, if more direct work of hitting the dealers where they lived. He'd gotten so used to undercover work, he would literally walk from a courthouse where he'd been testifying and make a buy in his suit and tie. He didn't give a fuck anymore. And it only made him even better at the work. In the novel, Ned doesn't resign from the FBI. He just goes right back to work, chasing bad guys. And in the very last scene of the book, Ned is down in Louisiana. He's just finished visiting Lee Rich in jail, and he's at some hotel, sitting at the bar. The lighting is very dim and mysterious, and he meets this woman, who's clearly Simone. It's their first encounter. He's just having a drink, and she walks in. Using the mirror behind the bottles of booze on display on the top shelf, he watched the figure of a woman move through the dim light. He turned as she got close enough and found himself looking into the face of one of the most beautiful women he had ever seen. She put a newspaper in front of Ned. It was an article he had read, an article about the case and ultimately about him. Are you this agent? Ned turned to face her fully. The fuzzy edges of perception given to him by the whiskey started to straighten themselves as he scanned the room to be sure she was alone. Colombians were known to use women as assassins, or maybe she was just marking him for another. But apart from a few of the drunks in the room giving her the once-over, no one was paying any attention to him. Who's asking? The woman goes on to tell Ned she knows someone down in Colombia who's in deep trouble. Ned took her by the elbow and guided her to a seat next to him. What is it you need? He asked. She looked back at him with tears glossing the surface of her eyes. We need your help. And that's how it ends. Kind of suddenly. I guess you could call it a cliffhanger, or a teaser for a sequel, but you get the basic idea. Ned is about to go off on another adventure to help this damsel in distress. While he never directly admitted it to me, I think Ned spends a fair amount of time thinking about how this all might have played out differently. In addition to his novel, he teamed up with different writers and cranked out two screenplays, one called Dope and the other called The Cayman Connection. Like the novel, they read kind of like alternate versions of history, parallel universes, with the same characters, but different outcomes. He had some guy that was writing some screenplay or something out in LA and and um, and I said Ned the whole story doesn't make any sense unless you tell the end it's really not a success story at all you know I mean sure his cases might have worked out great but you know it is not a success story at all and no one knows that better than Ned later on I told Ned what Kathy said well, that's, that, that could be looked at that way, you know. Well, I mean, it took a toll. It, uh, you take a psychological and a physical beating for all this stuff, you know. So every, everything you pay a big price for. It's almost like I was on a rocket, and it's a matter of how high is that rocket going to go before it turns around and falls back to Earth. I don't know. What, 
you know, that rocket was going to run out of gas one day. So maybe it did. You know. It's been about 35 years since Ned Timmons made his big bust, sending a whole host of criminals away to prison. Mike Vogel, the distributor, the grocery guy, he stayed in the Detroit area, in that quaint little town right out of a Norman Rockwell painting, kind of the last place you might expect to find a former crime boss. Mike also served 10 years in prison. His old life on the outside gradually fell apart. When you get out, or actually when you go in, there's a realization you don't control a fucking thing. You don't control anything in your life. Uh, except maybe when you breathe and when you don't breathe. And I was aware that uh, gone that long, no marriage could survive it. None whatsoever. By the time he got out, Mike's ex-wife had remarried. And when Mike went to pick up some of his old furniture from her house, he saw that his kids had posted some of their artwork in the kitchen, on the fridge. When he took a closer look, Mike saw that his kids had changed their last names. They'd taken on the stepdad's last name. Mike confronted his ex-wife. I said, what the fuck are you doing? This is, oh well, it's the way it was. You can't hold blame for people that believe they're doing the best for other people. Mike told me that he later reconnected with his kids, that he developed a relationship with them, but it took time. Sadly, just before this podcast was released, Mike passed away at the age of 69. As for Stephen Kalish, he told me that he had to come to terms with the past. Over the years, a lot of stories have surfaced about Noriega and how brutal he was, that he'd had a rival executed. Stephen claims that this wasn't the Noriega that he knew back in the early 80s. Still, it was a moment of reckoning for him. I was ashamed it's probably the best description ashamed that I would I had done so much and tied myself so closely to a man that was capable of such atrocities after getting out of prison Stephen started a telecom business that made gift cards you know the ones you swipe he says that his business did very well and he ended up moving into that big mansion out in Hawaii where I visited him Together, he and his wife, Fabi, run a horse ranch that offers equine therapy. You know, peace of mind through horses. The reality is, is in the years that I've been here with Fabi, I've learned a great deal about myself and a great deal about many things I was not aware of. And, you know, quite frankly, I never expected to be in a place where I'm at peace, where I feel safe, truly safe. As for Noriega, he served 17 years in federal prison in the United States. He was eventually extradited to France, where he spent about a year incarcerated on money laundering charges. Then he was extradited again, this time to Panama, where he spent roughly another five years in prison. He died at the age of 83. Lee Rich, you know, Mr. Beach Club. He was supposed to do 30 years in prison. In the end, he served 10. His sentence was reduced after he cooperated with the congressional hearings. When I caught up with him in Florida, he broke out a photo album that included pictures of him in jail. Lee showed it to me the way you might crack open an old high school yearbook. This is prison. This one. This is all of us in Lafayette, Louisiana in prison. That's the main players in that, all those trials was Vogel, Kalish, and myself. At one point, he actually came very close to trying to break out of prison. Each week, if you can believe it, Lee left prison to get dental work done. He was escorted by a transportation officer named Gene. The minute I got in the van, she'd give me the key. I'd undo my handcuffs in the back. And uh, always brought me food. 
And then I got to know Gene, all right? And we would have our little thing on the side, going to the dentist. I actually spoke to Jean. She told me that little thing on the side, it was just friendship. Anyway, that's when Lee hatched his plan. He had a pilot who was going to land a plane not far from the dentist's office, just swoop down and pick him up. But first, he'd have to get away from Jean, steal her car, basically. Just tell her, you gotta get out of the car now and take the key from the van and just leave her standing in the parking lot. So the big day comes. He's sitting in the car with Gene. He's about to make his big move when he realizes there's no gas in the car. It's almost empty. Okay, I would have got down the road maybe three miles <laughs> on the side of the road, no gas, out of gas, no money. I would have been busted, escaped. So I left it alone. I went back to the jail that night and cried my sorrows. <laughs> And Lee also says he couldn't do that to Jean because he really cared about her, deeply in fact. He and Jean, they ended up getting married. Kathy Timmons, she and Ned got divorced. Kathy raised her kids, two sons, almost entirely on her own. And she went on to have a really distinguished career in the FBI. After 9-11, she worked under Director Robert Mueller to help set up an office that shared intelligence and worked with state and local law enforcement. She's retired now, never remarried. She still stays in touch with Ned. You know, people were always surprised at, you know, how much we always still talked over the many years because I think he, you know, we had so much that we knew about one another and you know at the core what that's like being a police officer, being an FBI agent, working these things, um, our families. Back in 2008, Ned and Kathy actually worked a case together. Ned had been hired as a private eye to solve a particularly vexing murder down in Georgia. Ned knew he'd need help from a really good investigator, so he asked Kathy to help him review the case. And briefly, once again, they were a team. He's still never been able to actually leave that undercover role. He's never really replaced the people that he knew, the people that he was close to. It's like he never moved on. He never moved on from it. It stayed with him, and it's like he's still trying to um, find the end of it. it. It is, it's like he's still trying to find the end of the story. Ned Timmons still lives in the Detroit area. He's a successful private eye, runs a company called Legal and Security Strategies. He's handled security for local media outlets, and right now he's trying to chase down the guys in China who are counterfeiting American tobacco products. He also specializes in jet ski fatalities, investigating how and why people died while zipping around on their jet skis. After leaving the FBI, Ned and Simone were together for about two years. Ultimately, it didn't work out. They still stay in touch. In fact, Ned says that he periodically sends her a few hundred dollars to help with the bills. Over the years, Ned, he's also stayed in touch with Lee Rich. In the late 1990s, Ned built a house down in the Caymans. Two of them, actually. Got a big boat, and he started hanging out with Lee again. At that point, Lee was out of prison, and the Caymans were still his home, even though he was no longer the island's Robin Hood. Lee Rich and I were friends undercover, and we were friends when he got arrested, and we still talk once a week because our personalities congealed or whatever you want to call it. I love that he used the word congealed. The two of them remain close friends to this day. Recently, Ned planned a trip down to the Caymans. Lee was supposed to come too, but he had some health issues and he couldn't make it. Ned went anyway, and I tagged along. Down in the Caymans, Ned, he seemed to be so in his element. Sure, he was now in his 70s and walking with a limp, but he seemed to love reprising his role as a man of mystery. At the time, he was working on a bounty hunting deal to locate a highly sought after US fugitive. He had a driver taking him around, big guy, almost looked like a bodyguard. At one point, we headed over to the house of Lee's old butler, Bertley. You may remember him. This is the guy who took Ned fishing for Conk back when Ned was undercover. And at the time, Ned thought Bertley was actually going to kill him. 
Later on, when Ned lived in the Caymans, they actually became friends. Bertley passed away a few years back, and now Ned was visiting his widow. Hey. Hi. Who's there? You remember me? Ned. Yes, Good long to see time you. no see. Yeah. Okay. Uh. They sat down and reminisced about old times, back when Bertley was still alive. Ned seemed genuinely happy, caught up in all the memories. And as we were getting ready to leave, Ned, very discreetly, took out his wallet and slipped the widow some money to help out, make sure that she was all right. Okay, we, we gotta run. We gotta no okay. problem. Thank okay, you for coming. I appreciate it. <laughs> okay, Julia. Yeah. All right, thank you. Bye bye. Bye right, bye. Okay, Harry. Then he shuffled back to the van. And for a moment, I had this strange sensation that I was watching a play. And in it, the role of the island's Robin Hood was being played not by Lee Rich, who was out sick, but by his understudy. A man who knew the role, had memorized it, in fact, and played it well. Deep Cover is produced by Jacob Smith and edited by Karen Chikurji. Our story editor is Jack Hitt. Original music and our theme was composed by Luis Guerra and Flawn Williams is our engineer. Fact checking by Amy Gaines. Mia Lobel is Pushkin's executive producer. Ned's novel is read by Walton Goggins. John Custer is Pushkin's art director and our show art and character illustrations were drawn by Victor Curlo. You can see them at our website, deepcoverpod.com. The site was created by Tyler Adams. Special thanks to Julia Barton, Heather Fain, Carly Migliori, Lital Malad, Maya Koenig, Eric Sandler, Aggie Taylor, Khadija Holland, Zui Gwen, and Jacob Weisberg at Pushkin Industries. The first version of Ned's unpublished novel was written by James Coyne and edited by Andrea McLaughlin. Lee Rich has just published a memoir. It's called In Too Deep. It has the full story of his life. Stephen Kalish also has a memoir on the way, The Last Gentleman Smuggler. So please check them both out. Additional thanks to Sophia Kiafoulis, Twyla Gore, Scott Vieira, Nathan Saunders, Elizabeth Ostman, and James Baxter. Tape syncs this season were by Elizabeth Eads, Barbara Sprunt, Robert Jimison, Audrey McGlinchey, Greta Weber, and Sean Cologne. And a very special thanks to Jeff Singer at Stowaway Entertainment, who uncovered this story and thought I should tell it. I'm Jake Halpern.